All right, welcome to the drill down. We've got the business stories behind stocks and a move. I'm Corey Johnson with episode number 242. All right, just ahead, we explain a new way to think about NVIDIA's incredible earnings results. I think this will help give us some context. And Palo Alto Networks results show us that not all tech companies are benefiting from AI, at least not yet. And a fascinating conversation with semiconductor design powerhouse Synopsis and a brand new CEO, Sassine Ghazi. He's been at the company for a long time, but this is one of the first interviews he's given now. We're going to check in with Synopsis in this time of AI and semiconductors. Great time for his business. We're going to first get to sponsor time. The Drill Down is brought to you by Braintrust, a global talent network that matches highly skilled technical freelancers with the world's most reputable brands. Braintrust has helped clients like Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Porsche, Under Armour, and more build agile tech teams fast at a fraction of the cost. Visit Braintrust.com, that's B-R-A-I-N-T-R-U-S-T.com to learn more and get 20% off when you use our link, Braintrust.com slash Drill Down. All right, I'm Futurums Chief Market Strategist, Corey Johnson. Welcome to Futurums The Drill Down. I'm here in the San Francisco Ferry Building. You can hear the bells and ask not for whom the bell tolls. I wasn't planning on it. Ben Wilson. Ben, don't ask. Okay. I need to know basis. <laughs> and only the Grim Reaper needs to know. But uh, glad to have you on the mic today. You've been very editing, ominous. Uh, I'm glad to be off. here and, and not grimly reaped. <laughs> Um, yeah, we've uh, we've been cranking out a lot of earnings results, but here we are on the Drill Down uh, podcast and now webcast to kind of share the most important stories of the week with a big interview as well. Exactly. Well, and people who are stoked to get your takes, now there's a lot more of them. You don't just get three companies a week. We, we're, uh, we've got a lot, more to, a lot more to enjoy. Corey, what stocks are you drilling down on today? How can we do this without talking about NVIDIA? It wouldn't be smart to do it without talking about NVIDIA. Everybody else is talking about NVIDIA, so I'm excited to hear what you have For to say. For good reason. Ben, exactly. Uh, we know it's under the ticker NVDA, but please tell us the market cap of this company because it's just uh, amazing even to say. The market cap is $1,997,250,000,000. That sounds like a made-up number. It, it does. It, it, it's, it's, yes, exactly. It's just like it's just silly sounds. Because that's kind of what the market cap is. Silly. Exactly. The shares are up 10% in the last week. But in the last 12 months, shares are up 237%. Um, so, Corey, why don't you tell us the story with NVIDIA? Yeah, it's it's, it's an amazing one. And uh, it's been sliced and diced so many ways. And I say it's, it's a silly number. I, what I mean is it's hard to conceive of a number that big when you were talking about the value of a company. But the company is, is the value of the stock is in a lot of ways, maybe always, based on the value of the, of the business and the growth of the business and the growth of the business as recorded this quarter. It's just fantastic. And last quarter was the same thing. Uh, these are some of the best earnings results I have ever seen in my life, and I have seen a lot of earnings results in my life. Uh, the quarter had $22 billion in sales. That was up 270% on a year-over-year -year basis. It had $12 billion in, in profits and net income. That was a... 770% on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, and that's because these chips just do things that no other chips do. So they are they are so hot in the marketplace. Uh, at Futurum Group, we figure that they've got about 95% of the market for AI chips right now. Um, just fantastic, at least for this, this particular kind of data center work that they're doing. Um, the only other company that's even in the conversation is AMD with about 5% market share uh, competing against NVIDIA. So, um, And the, the product's very different. Uh, and it really is the NVIDIA product once made for computer gaming is perfect for uh, dissecting these large language models in data centers. They're crushing the business. They're able to raise prices. They can't make enough of these chips. Uh, and the result are these fantastic quarters that are now fantastic on a profitability basis. And I think... Um, I spent a lot of time with Intel this week. We won't talk about Intel much today, but um, I spent a, a whole day with Intel and Intel executives. And one of the things uh, this company, Intel, as they start to turn things around in this business, when they talk a lot about margins and profit margins, EBIT margins, if you will, well, the EBIT margins for Intel are pretty good at 25.7%, but the EBIT margins at NVIDIA, which were once in the teens and 20s only a year or two ago, are now over 61%, 61.5%. EBIT margins in the most recent quarter. So 
just fantastic profits from this company uh, from this company on top of fantastic revenues and yeah it's all about what's going on in the data center and in ai using nvidia chips so here is the ceo uh, jensen wang talking about um, uh, the things we know about like chat gpt and other search things that are happening and the other things that are going to happen with ai check this out for the very first time a data center is not just about computing data and storing data and serving the the employees of a company, we now have a new type of data center that is about AI generation, an AI generation factory. And you've heard me describe it as AI factories. But basically, it takes raw material, which is data, it transforms it with these AI supercomputers that NVIDIA builds, and it turns them into incredibly valuable Tokens. These tokens are what people experience on the, the amazing, the amazing ChatGPT or Midjourney or um, uh, you know, uh, search these days are augmented by that. All of your recommender systems are now augmented by that. The hyper personalization that that goes along with it. Um, all of these incredible startups in digital biology, generating proteins and generating chemicals and um, the list goes on. So digital biology, uh, understanding, generating new kinds of proteins and chemicals, understanding what's going on in science, all now possible with these NVIDIA chips and all of these use cases of AI. Maybe you like uh, Google's Gemini better than you like uh, chat GPT. Maybe you're finding better results from Adobe Firefly images instead of the images from Stable Diffusion. I use all these things, but all of them relying on NVIDIA chips, Ben. That is wild to see this company have so much success. Um, what is it that you think sets them apart from so many other companies? Well, it's, it's the design of these chips. I mean, the, the, these yeah, chips are able to, to do uh, processing of lots of things all at once um, in ways that no other chips are, to make it quite simple. They're able to handle multiplicity of tasks, and no other chips out there can even do this. And so they are, they are alone in this marketplace and will be for a while. Good for them. Corey, what is your next drill down? Let's look at Palo Alto Networks. Yes, let's look at Palo Alto Networks. Trades at the ticker PANW. Market cap about $91 billion. Shares were down 23% in the last week, but for the last 12 months, shares are up 50%. Those feel like pretty good numbers, just uh, they're a little smaller compared to NVIDIA. I'd love to hear what well, the story down, is I mean, with Palo Alto Down Networks. 23% isn't good for anyone. That's true. That's true. Right? I, mean, I was looking at the if up 50%. If I was down 3%, I'd go from 6.5 to about know, four and a half feet. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> Maybe even, you know, just wouldn't be the same person. So, um, uh, and Palo Alto Network stock, not the same stock, because this business is not the same. Oh, wow, that transition came out of there. Look, uh, the business is going through a really interesting change, uh, and we unfortunately see it in this quarter's results, uh, and it really, it really caught up with the company. We've seen some hints of some issues with the company in terms of its growth rates. Uh, sales now were up 19% on a year-over-year -year basis, don't get me wrong. But when you look at their uh, their bookings, their remaining performance obligations, or what they call RPOs, their RPOs, uh, the growth of their RPOs has really slowed a lot over the course of the last year when it was up near almost 40% um, uh, a year ago dropping every quarter in the last year down to 23%. So what's going on with their customers? Why are their customers not buying this software this security uh, software so much? And what they're saying is that their customers are looking at competing uh, products from uh, Cloud, CloudStrike or Microsoft, or Fortinet, and they're saying, well, what do we need your Palo Alto network stuff? We've got so many vendors or customers are now saying to them, we gotta, you know, we're laying off workers, we're, we're looking at costs everywhere we can cut, we're spending money on AI, why are we buying all this stuff from Palo Alto Networks? Can you give us a better solution here? So right now, what the CEO told us during the conference call is they're changing. They're going to start offering free use of their platform alongside uh, some of their competitors like Cloud, CrowdStrike, Microsoft, and so on. Um, and this temporary giveaway is going to try to uh, convert their customers from buying kind of little fixes here to going for a Palo Alto Networks platform. And these platform sales are going to take longer to close but Palo Alto Networks thinks that this strategy is going to reduce customer costs up front, kind of hook them in, um, uh, get them into this kind of billing system with, with uh, Palo Alto Networks, get them into this platform sale, 
and maybe they'll be stickier for a long time to come. But right now, it's going to be kind of a painful transition. Here's the CEO, Nikesh Arora, trying to explain this on their conference call this week. We've noticed that we have a higher win rate on platform deals. We have a higher win rate in consolidation plays as opposed to best to breed head-ons, which end up costing more time and energy. And you see very, I like called it rogue behavior, where people start trying to desperately hold on to customers. So we are trying to shift our go-to-market towards a consolidation play and a platform play. Um, I think, as I said to uh, earlier, the right number to look at in this context is RPO. The underlying demand is strong. Our book of business is strong. Our pipeline is strong. Uh, there is nothing going on on the demand side. It's just that we see this pushing out of the buildings towards later parts as we get more and more consolidation offers and platform offers out there. So the book of business, he's saying RPOs are strong. I'm saying they're weaker than they've been. The growth is is not what it had been. He can say what he wants. I'm looking at the numbers right there, and you guys can see that the numbers were coming down a little bit in terms of uh, percentage growth. Growing, yes, but not at the same rate. And I think it's really interesting, Ben, we see so many companies spending on AI and maybe saying uh, when it comes to security, which used to be an easy sell, I think, says the guy who's never had to sell it, maybe the security <laughs> business being a little bit, you know, let's 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 see what we're getting here and and pause a little bit because the AI spend is happening at the exact same time. That makes a lot of sense to me. It's a it seems like security is a very saturated market right now. So good on them for trying to pivot and uh, we wish them the best. Corey, what's your next drill down? I want to look at analog devices, also in the semiconductor space, but a real different company from NVIDIA. I'm sure, even just based on the name. Analog devices trades at the ticker ADI with a market cap of about $95 billion. Shares were up 1% in the last week, and for the last 12 months, shares are up 3%. So we've got an up, bad. a down, and a more or less a flat this week. Yeah, but if it's up 3% in a year and the, and the S&P 500 is up better than 20% in a year, that we're going to call that yeah. just down. Not that, good. That's, this is an interesting yeah. company. It's an East Coast-based uh, chip company that's making uh, um, analog chips uh, for analog mixed single, signal uh, stuff, radio frequencies, power management. These are not the most complicated semiconductors in the world. NVIDIA's are the most complicated semiconductors in the world. And uh, their sales were way down this year, down 23% in a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, their profit's down even more so, net income down 52% in a year-over-year -year basis. Why is that? They're still selling a lot. They're still making a lot. Uh, but what happened is their customers were storing a lot. When you have a chip where the design hasn't changed a lot in the last few years, when you have a product that hasn't changed a lot in the last few, two, three, four, five, ten years, you can order as much as you can possibly get when you're low on components, and then you can sit on it, keep it on the shelf, because it's not going bad, it's not going stale, it's not like fish, it's not like a newscast, and it's not uh, like an, an NVIDIA chip, it is not the latest, greatest, it's something you can, can count on for a long time. And uh, in this business, customers lie. Analog devices customers lie, they said they needed more chips when they didn't, they were building their own stockpiles. Uh, on their shelves. And the result is uh, analog devices really seeing their business shrink right now because their customers have all they need. Thank you very much. And they look at it as a very sticky and diverse revenue source. When their analyst day last year came around, they gave this amazing number that 50% of analog device revenue is, defined, is derived from products that are 10 plus years old. Think of that in semiconductors. They're selling semiconductors into stuff that's been the same for 10 years. So you actually could have seen this problem coming if you looked at their numbers a little more carefully. If you look at their inventory, divide it by their cost of sales, so their inventory warning sign of, of days of inventory was going up and up and up throughout all of 2022 and 2023. Actually came down a little bit in the quarter they just reported, but clearly there's a problem for analog devices. And they say it's uh, all going back to the problems of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Here's the CEO, Vincent Roche, explaining what happened during the pandemic and how bad this is right now, the worst in 30 years, and how long it's going to take to get out of it. The event that caused the supply chain fracture was unique, um, and every single segment was impacted, every single customer, every single business. Uh, so this is truly the broadest base demand inflection I've ever seen in my, you know, 30-something years with, with ADI. And I've been through all those different... Um, all those different perturbations. So I think that's it's 
the uniqueness of the event itself, um, I think, is um, is what caused the level of impact. And, um, you know, we it, everything compounded. We saw the supply chain fracture, then we saw, we saw the shortage, uh, and then we got uh, the behavior that we typically see in, in a shortage situation. You get double ordering, uh, you get hoarding, and, um, you know, we're we're seeing that everywhere. Um, the area that we've probably seen, I would say, the, the biggest correction is in the industrial market. And I think um, our sense is that, uh, you know, it began in the second, uh, kind of the second half of the past year. Uh, and that will take four to five quarters to correct, I believe, from, you know, the, the uh the beginning of the decline to when we start to see growth again. So second half of last year, four or five quarters, I think we're looking at least a year before things get better. More importantly, Ben, so does the CEO, uh, Vincent Roche, thinking it's going to take a while to dig themselves out of this hole. All right, let's move on now. Let's look at Synopsis. CEO uh, Sassin Ghazi joins us. It's one of his most extensive interviews since taking over the company and the sole job of CEO. A really interesting time, obviously, for Semiconductor Design. He joins us right after this. The Drill Down is brought to you by ERA. Never miss another critical event or insight ever. With ERA, customize your company watch list to track key events, mentions, filings, and more. All within an easy to use, customizable interface. That's ERA, A-I-E-R-A, dot -E com. Right, welcome back to the Drill Down Podcast. We're joined right now by Sassine Ghazi, as you can see. Joining us right now, where are you guys? You're down in the valley. I don't even actually know what city you're in. Yes, yeah, Sunnyvale. In Sunnyvale. Fabulous, yeah, glamorous yeah, yeah. Sunnyvale. Um, uh, uh, so for, for, we can start. You guys just reported a quarter. It was a really strong quarter. Uh, I think semiconductors, my my boss, Daniel Newman, the CEO of Future Group, likes to say that semiconductors are eating the world. And boy, it sure seems like that. Oh, and I should warn our listeners and viewers that they have chosen this great moment as we record this interview to repair the roof of the ferry building in San Francisco <laughs> right above me. So that's not people trying to break me out. That's just the sound <laughs> of the world getting better. Talk to me about what's going on in the world of semiconductors and why this is so important for a synopsis right now. So as you started, Corey, we reported a very strong Q1 uh, yesterday, 21% uh, year-over-year uh, revenue growth, uh, record uh, quarter, 36% year-over-year EPS. And the reason we were able to deliver such a great quarter, uh, there are three underpinning uh, secular trends uh, in our world. The first one is AI, which is requiring a more... You keep raising the bar in terms of complexity of compute to support the AI applications. The second mega trend is uh, silicon proliferation everywhere. Exactly what your boss is saying where semiconductor is becoming everywhere. And the reason it's becoming everywhere is if you fast forward five, 10 years from now, you truly see a future where most markets will have a smarter devices, connected devices powered by silicon. The third trend we're seeing, which is what we refer to in the industry as software-defined systems. This is where hyperscalers, for example, are, are investing in their own silicon. The mobile industry invested in their own silicon. Hyperscalers like like Microsoft, like uh, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Amazon exactly. Web Services, Google, Facebook. Exactly. You name them. They are investing in their silicon in order to unlock the opportunity and the user experience when they optimize the silicon all the way up to their software. Because you can use a general purpose silicon, but the, 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 the power, the performance, the cost, et cetera, is a much bigger opportunity they see by developing their own silicon. Now, in all those three vectors is fantastic news for Synopsys because we are sitting at the heart of that R&D innovation and product innovation in order to enable our customers uh, design their products. So I want to I want to talk about end markets first, and then I want to get down to some of the technology if we can do it that way. I don't know. Absolutely. But I thought that on your <clears throat> conference call um, when you reported earnings, you got a question from an analyst somewhere about what he called software defined automobiles, which was a 
silly word, but I thought, or wonderful word, I don't know. But the idea that I guess the Tesla introduced this concept, right, that you could have significant upgrades to the car or, or fixes of recall problems just through software design, but that it really changes um, uh, the process of designing an automobile. And I thought it might be a good place for you to talk about how your business has gone so much further than just de de uh, designing semiconductors. No, no, exactly. So that's actually the software defined vehicle is the industry term for it, but it does not only apply to. Oh, automotive. I know. It doesn't make it not ridiculous, but go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. But it does not only apply to automotive. It's uh, the, the hyperscalers, what they're doing is a software defined system in the data center uh, for industrial, et cetera, will be the same. So we refer to it as software defined system. What it means is you need to define the spec of the semiconductor chip based on how you're envisioning your system works. So let's say that you mentioned Tesla. As they're pushing updates over the air, they're of course not changing the silicon in the car. The silicon is still the silicon. But how do you design the silicon upfront, knowing that it's gonna sit in the car for four, five plus years, and you can update that software without changing that silicon? That's the innovation. That's when you need to look at the whole stack from the semiconductor chip all the way up to what you envision you need to update through your software. And that, correct me if I'm wrong, but that expands your business both in terms of the number of customers, the types of customers that you might have 20 years ago, Synopsys is probably not, not knocking on the doors at Ford and GM, or maybe you were, but also in the level of complexity, every level of complexity adds to how much you can bill and how much people use your software. Exactly. So we're, if you go back 20 years ago, uh, Synopsys was the company that provided some automation to the semiconductor designers. And they could achieve the next chip by using Synopsys and our industry, but they counted more on Moore's law. They just go to the next node, to the next process technology, and they got their better performance, better power, etc. You look now, the complexity of Moore's Law and the ambition to design uh, those advanced products, and I don't wanna overuse AI. It can be AI related or just a sophisticated car. Let's say like the Tesla, what they started a number of years ago. Those are new customers for Synopsys because they know they have to, either if they're designing their chip, it's a great opportunity because they use our software and IP to design the chip. But let's say you, they're not designing a chip they still need to understand the chip behavior when they're developing their system and their software. And we have technology that we call it virtualization of the chip. So you virtualize the chip in order to uh, give the spec to your semiconductor supplier. Now, you guys talk about design automation. I understand what that is. Can you explain what design IP is? It's something I, I saw you, you are, of course, new to the solo uh, CEO job, you've been there at the company for a long time, and, and I should mention once at Intel, so of course you're going to cite Moore's Law constantly, <laughs> but um, uh, why not? Um, uh, but but uh, what is design IP? Think of components of the actual semiconductor chip that are standard. For example, uh, all, almost every chip that connects to the outside world has a USB in it. The USB is a USB. There is no different standard for the USB. So instead of the customer designing their own USB, they come to Synopsys and buy the USB. So those are semiconductor components that we design those semiconductor components and sell them to the customer to accelerate their chip design and they put their resources where they differentiate. But you're not selling the phys a physical product. You're selling the design for a product that, or the license for the IP that you guys own. Exactly. Then they take that part of that, they take the design and they put it as part of the bigger design they're building. So they're building so blocks, they're Legos. They're Lego blocks, exactly. So if you think what NVIDIA does, what Intel does, what AMD does, et cetera, Qualcomm, you name it, uh, they're building what is called system on a chip. That system on a chip has many Lego blocks in it. Most of the standard interfaces which are very complicated and uh, uh, they're becoming many more interfaces to go from the chip to the memory, to the networking, et cetera. Those, all those interfaces that connect the chip to another chip or chip to the outside world, 
we provide those Lego blocks for it. And it's becoming 25% of our business. I was going to say it's a quarter of your revenues. Do you expect that to kind of maintain there? Or is that something that's going to grow as you add more um, uh, inventions, if you will? It's both. Uh, this business, uh, we communicate externally uh, uh, mid-teens uh, growth, uh, short to long-term uh, growth, which is growing in a very healthy way. Uh, and you can think of it, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you were uh, in an Intel uh, event uh, yesterday. Uh, for example, if you're a foundry, think of the foundry as a highway. You need an on-ramp. If you're a customer and you want to design on an Intel foundry or TSMC or a global foundry, you need those building blocks to design on the foundry. And when the foundry goes to the next node, you need to, for Synopsys, needs to create those IP for the next node and the following node, node meaning a process technology. I was going to say, the, the node being the new way of doing it. That's right. That's right. That's there right. was and some there laughter new- in, the, in the analyst uh, room yesterday when... When the CEO of Intel is asked, can you define, congratulations on five nodes in five years. Can you now define what a node is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for reminding me. Yes, node is an actual process technology. So when you think of Moore's law going from one node to another node, it means going from one technology to another technology. And in the case of semiconductors, thinner and thinner and obscenely thin uh, uh, wafers and, and, and semiconductors. You know, when you think about it, Carl, when you talk about few millimeters square and you're putting hundreds of billions of transistors. It's just amazing. It's, it's incredibly amazing. And in order to jam more, which right now it's anticipated to be a trillion transistors in a chip, trillion, that's when you need to continue going down the Moore's Law uh, uh, um, uh, scaling of right. the transistor in order to put that technology in there. It's amazing stuff. And since we're, we're deep into the weeds of, of process, talk to me about multi-die and why that's good business for Synopsys. So uh, now that's a good se- uh, segue for it. Because See, if that, you that's my at, job. I, yeah. I, they, this is what I get paid for, is the segue. <laughs> yeah, so, thank you. <laughs> so when you look at the jamming all these transistors, it's expensive. Uh, any mistake you do is very, very costly. So so there are different ways of designing a system. Uh, You don't have to move the entire chip to the latest and greatest uh, technology. You can move part of the chip, which is typically the compute part, the AI part, the CPU, the GPU, et cetera. But the rest of the chip, you can get creative and you disaggregate the chip from being monolithic into heterogeneous, where you have number of chips stacked on top of each other instead of one large chip. So and, 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 they're, and they're made at all the same moment, essentially, right? So as opposed to the packaging, the favorite semiconductor term, the rest of the world's going to be like, what, packaging? Like paper? Styrofoam? <laughs> but, but instead of packaging, it's really about uh, during the manufacturing process, manufacturing three things on top of each other all at the same moment so that the space between them is less. Am I, is that, am I oversimplifying that? No, exactly. No, you, you, you said it well. Uh, now you can stack them on top of each other, right next to each other, but they all at the end of the day are delivered as one product. So, it's, so the, the end customer, when you look at the end product, is one package where you have multiple chiplets and chips inside it. And the reason the market is going in that direction is the need for more compute, the need for more transistor, the more, the, you cannot go further in a monolithic way. You have to break it into a multiple die in a package. And it maybe helps not- other companies that aren't NVIDIA compete with an NVIDIA chip because the NVIDIA chips are already doing that in a single chip? NVIDIA is doing both. So NVIDIA has the single yeah. chip and their latest uh, product is it's uh, multiple chip in a package. A chip, yeah, yeah. Yeah, same, uh, same, of course, with anybody who's de- designing a hyperscale compute, they're going in that direction. So, why, but let's get to the second part of that. Why is that a better business for Synopsys than just the same business this year as it was five years ago? What drives our business is complexity. So if Moore's Law is not continuing, is multi-die, if HPC is not happening, if AI is not pushing the limit of compute, then the customer can stick with their derivative product. But the reason they're innovating so fast, because there are opportunities to drive more compute into the market, 
and they're looking for alternatives way to meet the challenges. We sit at the heart, at the center of working with the R&D team of our customer to give them the technology to design that innovation and IP. So when I, when I talk about design, typically I'm talking about the software we provide. And then the IP, it's uh, the moment you talk about multi-die, you need another different type of IP to connect die one to die two and to die three. And as you said earlier, when you put them on top of each other, guess what? You're dealing with a, a whole other set of issues like mechanical, uh, thermal, uh, those things heat up. How do you dissipate the heat? How do you make sure those dyes, uh, those chips that you're putting on top of each other don't warp or crack? Uh, exciting space to be in right now, given the the momentum and the pace of innovation. And and is there? Uh, and I want to get to AI, and I and I will. You said you don't want to overuse AI. I'm shameless. I'll overuse it constantly. <laughs> but I but I I wonder if if the complex. I, I get the idea that increasing complexity means more need for software. Maybe is it more hours of design? Is it more designers working on the same? chip or, or do you just charge more because you've got number one more IP and you charge more because you can? So like why is it a better business? Our cust if you, let me give you a couple data points. Uh, if you look at the EDA industry about 15 years ago, uh, we were about uh, upper single digit of the R&D spend of semiconductor. Now we're in about 13, 14% of the R&D semiconductor. They're not going from 8% to 13% in a decade because they like us. They're doing it because they have to. They well, know they got they to cannot... know you, I'm sure. Yeah, I wish that was that easy. <laughs> so it was, it's the demand, the complexity. They just cannot deliver the next product without our industry able to deliver the innovation to get them there. Now, that's one factor is complexity. The other factor is the demand for semiconductor engineers. There isn't enough engineers in the world to support the chip startup that they're happening in hyperscalers, in automotive, back to the earlier discussion we had. So we are innovating to provide an AI EDA instead of taking, say, six, seven engineers to design a Lego block. Can you do it with two? And we can. We're demonstrating it with our customers that you can reduce the effort. So, but and is, the that, time. is that more seats or is it more hours or just a higher price? We sell it both. So, what we mentioned yesterday in the earnings call is we're able to capture 20% uplift. So, if you're a customer that you're buying and spending X dollar with Synopsys without AI and you're happy, you're, you're making your chip, you're, de you're designing your chips. If you want to reduce that effort and use the AI technology, it's X plus 20% to get access to the AI technology and you, because you'll be selling more seat and an AI layer. So we have different monetization uh, uh, approach to, uh, for the value and impact we're delivering the customer. So then I want to follow with AI because I said I would um, and I keep my promises. Um, uh, I use AI a lot. Uh, I use AI a lot to help populate my scripts with financial figures, yeah. I use it to and and change URLs for things that I'm doing. I help it, it to automate some uh, tasks related to social media posts for all of us following all those people following me at Corey TV on Twitter, uh, at Corey John and uh, on uh, Instagram on TikTok. I strongly encourage people to follow at Drill Down Pod on TikTok. But I digress. Um, I think that um, it's but what I found is not it doesn't actually help me save time. It just helps me do more with the time. I'm still working stupid hours. I'm still going right up to my deadlines and sometimes a little bit past. I can do so much more. So I wonder um, when you talk, you had a brief but interesting conversation in your conference call about how designers are using generative AI, a new test product you've got at big companies, companies like Microsoft, uh, a generative AI programming uh, tool that you have written into some of the Synopsys software uh, for a new product. And I, I thought that was really interesting and I wonder what the results look like. Yes, so uh, if you zoom out, we have really two uh, part of AI and then we have the third part, which is the data, but put the data aside. The, your use of AI, that the way you describe how you use AI, is what we're calling it the synopsis.ai copilot. 
So instead of a user reading through the manual, trying to say, if I do this, what happens there? They just, with a natural language, they're able to interact with our software and get a assistant for uh, becoming more effective, more efficient. The use model there is new engineers are able to ramp up and become close to an expert much faster. So the ramp up of engineers in our world, it takes about seven, eight, 10 years to become an expert engineer. You can do it shorter. So that's one aspect of AI. There is the other aspect of AI, which is much deeper, is optimization. In our industry, is the most complex computational industry in the world. When we talk about billions of devices, that's all computation. So AI is prime to do optimization deep into the algorithm to make sure that you can get the job done faster and you are uh, correct by construction. The moment you deliver it, it should be functioning and uh, you don't waste the effort. Uh, we cannot halluc uh, hallucinate in our AI application because it will cost our customers many, many months and many millions of dollars. So it has to be correct when you deliver results. Yeah, I've been going through a lot of my old, I, I've got some standard models that I use for my financial models that I build with formulas that I thought were the best I could do in Excel. And I've been, I've been occasionally taking some <laughs> of those formulas that I've been using for 10 plus years, run it through uh, ChatGPT or, or Google Gemini, and it, have it get spit back a much shorter, much much more elegant yes, formula. Yes. And I don't know that it's saving my CPU any any work uh, using Excel, but it's a uh, it's it's a lot nicer to be able to edit a shorter formula. It's, that's a sure thing. And it, how wonderful that AI is making that possible. AI, you know, I know people are tired of hearing about AI, but I don't I'm think a so. strong I'm a strong believer that we're in that early journey with many, many use cases that are truly uh, foundational and they're gonna be uh, many inflection points in many industries. If, if they're not jumping on, if any CEO out there for any industry, regardless what you do, uh, what your company does, if you're not considering AI part of your workflow, AI part of your product and your customer experience, you're gonna be missing out on these inflection points. So Sin Ghazi is the CEO of Synopsis. Uh, we're so glad to have you. Thanks for your time today, really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Cody. Great to see you again, thank All you. All right, coming up next on The Drill Down, one number that tells us a whole lot, the bite, right after this. The Drill Down is brought to you by Futurum Group, where analysts, researchers, advisors, content creators, and marketing experts help business leaders anticipate and understand shifts in their industries and build strategies to leverage disruptive innovation. With deep analysis, Futurum Group's extensive industry experience delivers reliable research and data, thought leadership, and actionable advice to help you with your strategy and go-to-market efforts. Futurum Group. All right, we're back with the drill down to bite, the one number that tells us a whole lot. We got a bite. It's about the growth at Synopsis. So uh, interesting interview, interesting guy. Good looking interview too. Good looking CEO. Look, this is Sin Ghazi. But uh, the growth rates for this company are really strong right now. And if you look at them over time, they actually came down a little bit from last year, but uh, uh, the growth rate, I think the annual growth rate of revenues on a trailing basis, really strong for this business, 21.15%. There's your drill down earnings bite we're related to synopsis. So um, real steady growth from this company. Obviously you can hear the, the um, innovation that, that they've kind of built into their product uh, in particularly as it relates to IP, Ben. Um, so that their customers are getting the latest and greatest learnings from the entire industry. And uh, what a time to be at Synopsys when all the world is uh, uh, getting eaten by semiconductor design. What a time to be at Synopsys indeed. All right, well, thanks for listening to Futurums, uh, The Drill Down. I'm Corey Johnson. Thanks to Ben Wilson, of course, our editor extraordinaire. Futurums, The Drill Down, a production of 6.5 Media.